So I'm at the Answers in Genesis Creation Museum in just outside of Cincinnati, Ohio, in Kentucky, and I'm with David Menton. David, thank you so much for joining me this morning for this interview. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. David, tell us about your background, your education, and um, also a little bit about your work history. Well, let's see. Back in, uh, I always like to say, 19 Bello, <laughs> <laughs> I uh, graduated from uh, Minnesota State University in uh, Mankato, Minnesota, with a bachelor's degree uh, in uh, major biology, minor in chemistry, and then went on to get a PhD in uh, biology at Brown University. Uh, I spent a couple of years uh, at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And now, Alabama Brown University is, is a, considered to be an Ivy League school? Oh, yes, yeah. One of, one of the Ivy Leagues. <laughs> I survived with my faith in tech, by the way. <laughs> Uh, it must have been. It must have been a challenge. Yeah. So it was now, you actually, you you had become. When did you come to Christ? When were you a believer? Well, I was born in a Christian family, so I really don't okay. have a recollection of okay. not being a Christian. You know, All right. Brought up from the get-go that way. All right. But as you said, you survived Brown University. Right. With faith and tech, might be harder to do today. Uh, isn't it interesting? A university with a motto like "In Deo Speratus," you know, and God we trust. And, Really? Yeah, all the Ivy Leagues, I think, have a, a motto a on their seal that. that's mm -hmm. similar that reflects their Christian background. Yes, and, uh, very interesting. I'm not sure in God we trust is really the primary attribute of Brown today, or probably any other secular university. Uh, but uh, most of my career was spent at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. I was on the faculty there in the Department of Anatomy and Neurobiology. I wasn't a clinician. Uh, research and teaching, and uh, I was in the Department of Anatomy and Neurobiology, and the course master of a course called histology, that means looking through microscope. Mm -hmm. It comes from a Greek word histos, it means a web or a fabric, and it got that name, uh, studying through the microscope, because uh, everything looks kind of woven. And so they call it histology. Uh, one might think one is knit together in our mother's womb, wouldn't you? Uh, mm. So, uh, and I was a histology consultant for several editions of Stedman's Medical Dictionary. And really? Guest lecturer for a semester at Stanford University Medical mm -hmm. School, did research at Woods Hole Marine Biology Laboratory. Mm -hmm. Now, you were also, I believe, 14 years associate professor yeah. mm -hmm. of biology? Uh, and... Well, I was associate professor in the Department of Anatomy. Oh, right. So, uh, taught medical students uh, histology and uh, taught some gross anatomy as well. Okay. Uh, we took the bodies apart. We didn't put them together. There's a big difference there. <laughs> well, we're going to get into some of that in, this, uh, in our discussion, so uh, that sounds interesting. Now, the topic that we're really looking at here is that about creation, evidence for creation. In your mind, what do you think of as some of the best evidence for creation uh, that you like to present when you're talking to crowds? Well, I get asked that question very often, and uh, my typical reply is the best evidence is anything I happen to be looking at or thinking about at the time. Okay. <laughs> uh, if pushed for one example, uh, I usually say something like, uh, I would say the best evidence for creation is contemplating my navel. <laughs> now, that's a little bit shocking, I know, but uh, if you look at the navel, or the umbilicus, as we anatomists call it, uh, it uh, is where there was once an umbilical cord attached, and right. that went to a marvelous organ called the placenta. Yes. And when you arrive there, you're looking at something just about as marvelous as uh, anything in the human body. In fact, you know, the placenta really isn't the mother, it's not the baby, it's a third thing. Mm. Uh, without which none of us or any other placental mammals would be here. And it's easier to tell you what the placenta doesn't do than to tell you what it does do. <laughs> it's not a heart and it's not a brain. And that's why those two structures develop very early, very precociously in the embryo. You get that cardiac prominence and rapid growth of the central nervous system. But it does just about everything else. Uh, it is a lung. In hmm. fact, a, a baby could be born without lungs, survive till the placenta is removed, and then it would die. So with the help of the mother, this incredible organ that's neither mother or child uh, is a lung, it's a liver, 
Right. It's the digestive system. Mm. It's the urinary system, endocrine system. <laughs> One could go on. Absolutely marvelous. And uh, the surface of this organ is very convoluted, very folded. Mm. It looks like 20 little trees, each with a trunk and branches and stems. Uh -huh. uh, little trees just maybe an inch or so in diameter. We call them cotyledons. And uh, inside of these little trees, sort of where the sap would run, that's where the baby's blood flows into the placenta. These little trees are closely packed on the surface of this placenta. You can kind of see lumps there. And uh, it's across the bark, if you will, of these trees that everything has to pass between mother's blood and baby's blood. Mother's blood is sort of like the wind blowing through the little grove of trees. Uh, and the bark on the tree is, a, is essentially a single cell as we know. Yeah, biggest cell in the body. If you could flatten it out. The biggest cell in the body is in the placenta. Uh, on the surface of the placenta, sort of where the mm -hmm. bark would be on the tree. And it's a very thin layer and uh, it develops from many separate cells that fuse together. Mm -hmm. And we call that a syncytial cell when you get many cells fuse. So you have one cell membrane but lots of nuclei, millions and millions of nuclei. And it's been estimated if you could flatten this whole sell out, it would be about the size of a living room area rug, about 8 by 11 feet. <laughs> and across this seamless barrier, everything flows from mother's blood to baby's blood or baby's blood to mother's blood. So a single cell has m many nuclei. In this case, yeah. And we have so other the, examples the various of cells DNA like that. DNA is in the nuclei, of course. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's through cell fusion. It's a standard trick by which the body makes big cells wherever it needs big cells, foreign body, giant cells, things like that. And, uh, so one could think of many other examples, uh, even simple little things. For example, our eyelids. Uh, we have a muscle that raises and lowers our eyelid, and it's primarily the upper lid that's moving. Okay. Uh, not the lower lid, it's the upper lid. And the muscle that lifts it, the skeletal muscle, like we have in our arms, mm -hmm. called the levator palpebri. <laughs> superiors. And uh, being skeletal muscle, uh, think of it, if we were to hold our lid open like holding my hand like this, eventually the muscle would fatigue and the lid would go down. The Lord's aware of the problem. <laughs> There's a second muscle that's smooth muscle called Mueller's muscle that sort of ties in with the skeletal muscle. And the advantage of smooth muscle is that it can contract all day long without fatiguing. So we have smooth muscle to hold our eyelid open on the long haul, keeps it from dropping. And then we have skeletal muscle, so maybe we can wink at one another, <laughs> go to sleep nights or whatever. Uh, the body's full of these things. So there's go just, on, just all pick these area different muscles could... working together to create, to allow that particular anatomy to work well. So this actually leads to a question that I, is, is really a big mystery to me, is how is it like inside each of the cells, there's a great deal of communication going on. You know, mm -hmm. cells are like a city, I understand. Right. Um, but then the cells also interact and communicate with each other. And so, for example, what you were just talking about, you have the various muscles. And, and of course, of course the, tr the brain at this point is probably, um, you know, communicating with these muscles and, and help, helping them to having them contract and, and uh, do what they do. But... As far as cells themselves, knowing, isn't there a communication process? Yes, cells definitely have to talk to one another, as it were. Uh, one of the channels by which cells talk are, are through little junctions called gap junctions, uh, where cell membranes touch one another. Mm. Uh, sort of like a little closer fit there, a little button. And uh, electrical signals can go across from one cell to another. Now, would they go from DNA to DNA? In these uh, cells? Not necessarily genetic information, but uh, electrical information, ionic stimuli might go across. To, uh, so, uh, yeah, to give you an example of how cells need to talk to one another, consider the cells in your heart. Uh, the heart doesn't require an external nervous system to contract. The heart muscle cells have a built-in innate tendency to contract. If you have cells from the heart just growing in a dish, individual heart muscle cells, they contract okay. in a rhythmic way. And if you had a dish full of these cells, they'd all be kind of marching to their own drummer, contracting at different times. 
But when two of these muscle cells touch one another and make this communication, they start contracting together. So clearly cardiac muscles can talk to one another. Now, the heart does have a nerve supply. We need that to up and down regulate, you know, as we exercise or not. Uh, so without that sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, the heart couldn't up and down regulate. But without a nervous system, it will beat. <laughs> One of the things that I, is just such a, a marvel and mystery to me is the thought of, so if, if you get an injury or you get a cut, the body communicates to certain cells to uh, so, okay, we need white blood cells in this area for uh, infection control. We need uh, U cells to die. I mean, where, where is that information coming from? And how does that work to say, well, okay, so now these cells have to die so that there's um, healing that takes place? Yes, a great deal of that kind of signaling goes on as well, which doesn't involve cell-to-cell -cell contact, but can involve chemicals that are dispersed in the environment around the cell, and these chemicals can cause other cells to react in certain ways to recruit cells, mm -hmm. uh, to recruit white blood cells to show up at a site of infection, for example. Uh, there, there are many examples of this kind of recruitment. One of the most amazing probably is, are the bones of the body. We have two types of cells, basically, with bone. We have bone makers and bone breakers. <laughs> You might be, wonder why you need bone breakers, actually bone dissolver would be a better word. The bone maker is an osteoblast, which means a, a cell that makes bone. And the bone breaker is an osteoclast, that means a cell that eats bone or erodes it. Hmm. And bone is dynamic, it's changing all the time. We think of bone as sort of almost like rock or concrete or something, but no, it, it's alive. And uh, Osteoblasts will lay down bone in one area, osteoclasts will remove it at another. And so your bones can actually change shape depending on how you're using them. A lady becomes pregnant and all of a sudden we have 20 pounds of weight that hasn't been there a year Interesting. ago. Interesting. And the bones of the pelvis and of the legs and what have you will actually remodel, change its shape if not on the surface inside all these little beans bone called spongy bone can reorient. Or anybody gaining weight, I would imagine, their yes. structure is Bone actually... Bone density mm -hmm. needs to increase. Uh, or losing is, weight a great deal. You know, this is so. why you know, women who have problems with osteoporosis, uh, usually it's less of a problem for a lady who's, who's heavy than it is for one who, who's very light. Uh, when astronauts were sent out into space and were weightless, they would lose bone density. Uh, now, if they weren't out there too long, they would gain that bone density back. But uh, my understanding is that some of the Russians who were out there for you know many months uh, had trouble getting full recovery of that bone loss. So, uh, yeah, lots of lots of signaling between cells in the body, <clears throat> and some cells you wonder what kind of signal they could get. For example, on our skin, uh, the dead cells on the surface are falling off as individuals. You know. Uh, not one at a time, but individually, unless you have a scaling disease. And uh, they're falling off at a rate that if you just were to take off your clothes and stand in one spot for a year, at the end of a year, you'd have about eight, nine pounds of dead cells at your feet. And they have to fall off at precisely the rate that they're being made down at the bottom of the skin, the, ep the bottom of the epidermis, the layer that mm -hmm. makes these dead cells. Hmm. And uh, so how, how can they fall off at just the right rate? If they fell off, say, 1% too fast, you could lose the stratum corneum in time, and uh, without that dead layer in your skin, you probably wouldn't survive more than an hour. Uh, you'd have massive water loss, go into shock, and die. So we don't think of the dead layer of the skin that uh, blisters and we get a burn or something as being that essential to life, but it is. Uh, so many parts of the body have to work together work together perfectly. People say, you know, sometimes, how can you believe the eye evolved by chance? It's too complex. But that's not the issue. Complex just simply means, boy, there's a lot of parts in the eye. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the parts, just like the parts of an airplane lay, laying out on a runway, will not fly. It requires something else. It requires specification. In other words, parts have to be put together in a certain way. Okay. And when they're put together properly, then the parts integrate with one another. And so finally, it's integrated complexity. 
uh, that really is what makes the body so special. Mm -hmm. And we can tell that when we see it. It's something that's obvious. So if we were to go to an evolution website, one of the things they would talk about in relation to the R, I, is they would say, well, there's some, if God existed and, and there was design, uh, he's certainly not a very good, he or she is mm -hmm. certainly not a very good designer because well, you see through the eye, and then it flips upside down, and I don't remember all of their artic all of their arguments. Uh, maybe you could help me with some of that, but it just seems so uh, shallow in a way. Um, but how do you respond to people that that say that God's design of the eye or other features uh, is really not all that marvelous? Isn't it interesting that people often who are often atheists are basically saying this? Of course, there is no God, but if there were a God, mm -hmm. he'd build the body my way. Uh, he wouldn't build it the way it is. He'd build it the way I think it ought to be built. And then they make another logical fallacy when they say, I can show you evidence of poor design on the body. Therefore, we've proven there's no design at all. Well, I had an automobile once that I personally considered to be poorly designed. <laughs> But I'm sure it was designed by somebody. I just didn't agree with the design. Uh, finally, a lot of the mistakes and errors they point out just reflect their own shallow understanding exactly. of yes. the organ. For example, in the eye, the retina is upside down. Uh, this is like the film and a camera, or today we'd say the CCD, mm -hmm. uh, being in there upside down. Mm -hmm. And you'd think, well, you know, that wouldn't work. It wouldn't sense the light. It wouldn't produce the image. Uh, the retina is upside down. The light-sensitive cells are pointing away from the light, not towards the light. Oh, do the evolutionists have fun with that one? You know, where's your God? He got the film and the camera upside down. Uh, just recently, a few years ago, we discovered uh, the wisdom of this. All along, there have been good reasons why it would be upside down for nutritional reasons. Primarily, these light-sensitive cells are metabolically very active, have a very high demand for blood, oxygen, etc. And so they're tucked down into a sort of a lake of blood in the choroid of the eye. Uh, if you pull a retina off that bed, uh, you'll lose your vision in that area, like a detached retina. So it's important they be tucked in there. Uh, but it did seem counterintuitive that the cells would be upside down. Now, we didn't take a hit on it. The, the sensitivity of the eye, uh, the photoreceptors have been shown to respond to individual photons. An eagle has an upside-down retina. All vertebrates do. They can see a fish under the surface of the water up to a mile away. Uh, not only that, but we're not limited by the resolution of our retina. We're limited by the resolution of the optics, the cornea and lens. So uh, when the evolutionists say the retina is all wrong and we'd see better if it were improved on, I don't think they really know what they're talking about in this case. Uh, anyway, here, not too many years ago, it was discovered that a certain cell type in the retina that we've known about for over 200 years, Mueller cell, once again Mueller arises, okay. <laughs> Mueller's muscle, now Mueller cells, in the uh, retina uh, are particularly numerous where we see sharply in the fovea of the eye. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are the only cells in the retina that are like tree trunks that go the full thickness. Mm -hmm. All the rest of the cells are like layer cake, one layer after another. Okay. And by the way, the retina is part of the brain. Uh, so uh, all the light photons have to go down through all these layers to get to the bottom, and that looks like bad design. But now we know that Mueller cells are living fiber optics. So you know how fiber optic works? Light can go through at nearly the speed of light uh, in the air, and uh, it, uh, you know, 186,000 miles a second or so, uh, knock off a few miles, and it goes down through this living fiber optic it can work its way around any intervening cells without taking any loss, as long as your input and output end is in register. How does, so, that, uh, how does the upside down nature of the lens, uh, uh, how is that enhanced uh, of the retina? Well, as you say, the retina being upside down, there are nutritional advantages to having the retina mm -hmm. in the way it is. It gets these photoreceptor cells close to the, the blood supply that they need. Uh, there are other reasons why that represents a good design. The only downside is it would seem that the photons coming through the upper layers would be scattered before they hit the photoreceptor at the bottom. 
okay? And I'll admit, I used to give the lecture on the eye at the med school. I'd get yes. the Mueller cell and I'd say, here's a cell, you can memorize the name if you like. We don't have a clue what it does. But now we know what it does. It's a fiber optic. And so the fiber optic is carrying the light across all the layers to the bottom where the photoreceptor is. And you solve the problem of all of the reflecting off the various cells and nuclei and fiber okay. tracks. It gets a straight shot through a fiber optic, lots of fiber optics. So you see, a lot of times we say something is poorly designed in the body. It probably, in fact, I'm quite sure it reflects lack of understanding mm -hmm. uh, or knowledge. It reminds me a lot of the problem of what, what was used to be called junk DNA. Right. And that it was Absolutely. called junk DNA, maybe at least partly because they did not understand its function, thought that, that it did not have function. And so you could say the same thing about the eye or some of these other structures that um, we are still uh, in the dark about. Not, it's not fully understood as to the rationale. Uh, another. Another example that I remember reading um, that Richard Dawkins would talk about is that, is it in the giraffe? I believe there's a certain um, nerve that mm -hmm. goes way down and then back <laughs> up again. And, and this, this whole thing is like, well, he uses this uh, as this great, great illustration of, of how uh, God would, or a designer would never uh, design in that way. How do you respond to that? Well, first of all, why not? What is, what is the know, nerve called? Why not called? make it Let's that way? Go ahead and the, the nerve is, is the recurrent laryngeal nerve that you're right. speaking of here. And uh, it goes uh, down along the side of the neck, and it loops under the aorta mm -hmm. on one side okay. and under the subclavian artery on the other. And uh, so it's starting up here, going down the neck, looping under, and coming back up to the larynx. Okay, but in the Jesus giraffe, speaking. I think what they were showing longer is that neck, it goes, it's a yeah, longer, long neck that goes way down loop. and then way back up again. And it just didn't seem, because you, you could just you know, go from point A to point B and it would uh, make more sense. The first point to make, it works very well. Uh, point number two, this is a result of what we call a morphogenetic movement. In other words, during the development of the embryo, there, there are movements. For one thing, the embryo is getting longer. And some parts of the embryo grow faster than others. And certain contacts need to be made very early. Other contacts between nerves and their target can be made later. It turns out that the, the, the nerve, the laryngeal nerve, takes a direct shot from the vagus nerve right into the larynx in the embryo. Mm -hmm. But the aorta, subclavian arteries, are anterior to it or towards the head end. We call it cephalad. They're more cephalad in their location. As the embryo elongates, at first it doesn't even have an egg. But as the neck elongates, imagine a giraffe starting to elongate, uh, these arteries sort of hook the nerve, as it were, that had a straight shot and pulls this loop down. Mm -hmm. uh, it still works. And if you like these kind of things, the body is just full of vestiges of embryology. Right. Uh, we have a lot of interesting vessels. For example, the blood vessel, the artery and vein that goes to the ovary and the testes, takes a root that's almost two feet long. Mm -hmm. It's coming up from high on the aorta and inferior vena cava and going all the way down to the location of the gonads, be they testes or ovaries. Right. And uh, the reason that vessel takes that route is that reflects the elongation of the body and the movement of these gonads from the time they're developed in the embryo to their final resting place. Uh, sometimes, we see evidence of vessels and nerves being trailed behind, as in the case of the gonads. In the case of the kidney, we have the same thing. Kidneys really develop down in our pelvic region, uh, and they migrate up to their position up in the back. Uh, and uh, the uh, so you're saying you're saying in the embryo, it begins very low, and then as the organism or the the, the organs themselves may move, mm -hmm. or the organism is mm -hmm. elongating. It's a combination of things. Uh, there, I guess you could say the kidneys could have done one of two things. They could have left their hookup uh, down on the iliac arteries going towards the leg, and then had this long artery and vein coming all the way up to where the kidneys are in the back. Or in this case, it doesn't do that. In this case, as the kidneys move up, the arteries are sort of like a pair of them, and they walk like this. They walk up the vessels. 
And so they make their attachment more directly right into the aorta and the vena cava rather than having a trailing vessel going down to the legs. Uh, but if you've done some gross anatomy as I have and dissected enough cadavers, you've seen every variation possibly imaginable. I've seen a whole fan of arteries going from straight into the kidney all the way down the aorta all the way to the legs. So uh, people talk when they sometimes really don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> David, this has really been a pleasure. I very much appreciate you uh, doing this. And so whether it's um, a nerve from a giraffe or the eye and, or, or any number of other features, we're seeing God's marvelous design and, and creativity uh, in these features. Thank you so much for all your expertise, your, um, how you speak, uh, the many, many messages, you've given it a very, very interesting through uh, Answers and Genesis. Thank you for your help. Thank you.